Here we have the conic sections, the different kinds of shapes that arise when you slice a cone with a plane, intersected with a plane. So the uh, the Greeks studied conic sections in great detail. You know, there's a great treatise by Apollonius on conics, which so it's hundreds and hundreds of uh, theorems. You know, figuring out uh, every, everything under the sun that there, there is to know about the conic sections, basically. But uh, uh, the, all, all the theoretical theorems about them with with great depth. But th I would like to ask why? Why would anybody want to study conic sections? What's so interesting about uh, slicing a cone? It seems like a very arbitrary type of geometrical object to study. You can slice all kinds of shapes. You can have. You know, why would you pick these guys and write hundreds of theorems about them? What's so special about conic sections? So I would like to consider some different uh, possible motivations for why you would want to do such a thing, study conic sections. Here, first, you can say uh, circles. Obviously, we all know th uh, the ruler and, and compass of, of Euclid and the constructions of circles in terms of uh, that, that, that we have encountered previously. So uh, you say conic sections are kind of the next step a little bit along those lines. And here is what I have illustrated over here with, with these string constructions that if you want to make a circle, you know, you, th you just pin down one end of a string and then you run the other guy around in a circle like that. But if you want to make an ellipse though, you can do it in this fashion. It's, it's almost the same kind of idea, except you have two endpoints of the of the string tied uh, down onto sticks like this, and then your your pen is holding the the, the string as stretched as you can and running it around in, in this fashion so that you end up with an ellipse. So well, you might say it's almost like a circle, so to speak. So you continue. Uh, if, if circles are so interesting, surely you're interested in circles, then why wouldn't you be interested in ellipses, which is almost the same. So that's one way of looking at the uh, reason for studying conic sections. This is the first one. But what about here's I have now a second uh, proposal also to consider. In uh, ellipses and, and conic sections, they arise naturally in optics and perspective painting like for instance look at this here I have a picture of some coffee cups and the rims here these coffee cups are ellipses in the picture well, in the real life they are circles but when you uh, project them onto a film uh, you know screen they become ellipses and that is uh, so that would be a reason for studying uh, ellipses then because they are like images of circles so to speak we can see why here in this fashion. This is the uh, the principle of, of perspective drawing or of uh, photography. It's that you have the guy. He's looking at this cube here, and all the rays from the cube, from all the corners, the light rays are going into his eye there, forming a kind of cone of uh, cone of light that hits his eye. And when you make a a painting or a, a picture of something. You basically intersect this cone of light with a flat plane, like the canvas that has been drawn here. So if you want to make a perfect painting of a cube, you are essentially taking an intersection of this, uh, all these rays of light as they are heading toward the eye. So that's how you can end up with viewing a circle as an ellipse, like we see here. Here's here the guy is looking at the circle, but then when he's intersecting the cone of, of light coming from the circle, he intersects it at some angle, perhaps, and then he ends up with an ellipse. So this is how the ellipses would arise in naturally in this in this fashion as as projections of circles. So and here we have another example. We have a lamp, something you can see in everyday life. The, this lamp here is shining onto this uh, corridor wall, and you can see uh, these uh, the shapes that are formed by the light are in fact. Uh, conic sections are parable as in this case because you can Im picture it like this that you have the source of light is the vertex of a cone so to speak it shoots out the because of the circular shade uh, in which it the the la lamp light is contained it sends out a, a cone of light and uh, the wall is can be considered a, a plane that intersects this cone of light almost like this orange uh, slice in this picture you know the wall is like a on like this orange slice there coming in and cutting off the cone of light and therefore the light uh, leaves a hyperbolic shape uh, on the on the wall there like that so that would be a good reason for studying conic sections that uh, they keep arising in a natural fashion like that in optics painting light phenomena and so on. okay 
Here's another proposal, so we were off to a good start here. We had two good ones already. Now here's the third one. A natural, it arises in an astronomical context. Well, let me show you how that plays out in terms of sundials and things. So I have here uh, some field. Is, and now I'm going to place in this, in this stick or pin that I just uh, stick into the ground there at a certain point. Now, when the sun rises in the morning here, whoop, then it will uh, shine on my uh, marker pin that I put here and it casts a certain shadow. It will be a long shadow like this because the sun is so low in first thing in the morning. And then the sun is coming up here, going higher, and then the, 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 the shadow will be uh, creeping inwards a little bit. And when the sun is uh, going up uh, around midday, the sun is very high like this and casts a short shadow, you know, and midday, you know, it's very short indeed. And then uh, in the evening, the sun is heading down the other side and then the, the shadow uh, repeats itself doing the same kind of thing the other opposite direction. And throughout the whole course of the day, we get then uh, for every uh, place, the, the sun is uh, for every position of the sun in the sky, you get another one of these points on the ground. And I say that the collection of all these points actually make a uh, conic section because of this reason. We can think of the path of the sun through the course of the day as being a, a circle. If the sun has orbit in the sky, is is essentially circular. So. And uh, there, therefore, it, uh, all the light rays from the various positions of the sun passing through the the uh, the tip of my stick there are that defines a cone, and then that cone of uh, the the cone of uh, uh, these the, the cone of shadow from the uh, from the pin of my needle uh, defines uh, it's then intersected with the ground. So when I all of these dots here. They, that's the uh, that's the plane of the ground, uh, the field on which it stands. So the, uh, the this cone defined by the pin and the sun is intersected by a flat plane, namely the ground. And that's why you end up with a conic section uh, mark on the uh, on the ground there when you do this uh, when carry out this this measurement in the course of a day. So that is the foundation for how sundials work, how you determine time based on the position of the sun and so on and you know, different times of years, it has different patterns and so on, as we uh, see, it's the basis for the sundial over here. So, okay, that goes on the list, uh, how to make sundials, how to understand this, the motion of the sun, the stars and so on. Okay, uh, here's another, uh, uh, yet another reason for studying conic sections, natural motion. Uh, the things move in a conic way by nature, and here we have an example of this bouncing uh, basketball here, following a parabolic path so like Galileo discovered paths of uh, fall projectiles or falling objects or objects in free uh, motion under gravity are uh, indeed parabolic so that's th these things follow parabolic paths like this however this was not the reason for the Greeks you know because it was only discovered in the 17th century and here we see some just slightly before in 15th century still people were quite confused about these kinds of paths they have not yet mastered uh, the the parabolic nature of these things and these are not parabolic and here are some more people having misconceptions about how cannonballs move so that's uh, clearly not the reason why the Greeks studied it and also uh, the planets orbits of the planets here we have Kepler was the one who discovered that planets move in ellipses a very uh, striking result nowadays but in Greek times, though, we were still relying on circles, combinations of circles, to describe the motion of the planets. Nevertheless, it's an excellent reason to, to study conic sections, certainly, the projectiles and the planets, or nowadays, anyway, or from the 17th century onwards, anyway. It's a very good reason to study. And now, here's the final item on my list. Maybe almost a letdown in, in the light of all these very interesting reasons. You have what sounds like a kind of mundane reason today, maybe. Uh, conic sections can be used to double the cube what does it, it even mean? Well, like this. Suppose I have a square and I want to make a square that's twice as big. Then I can do it in the f on the basis of this uh, picture that I've shown on the top here. That's a, a picture we encountered before. So the little diamond-shaped uh, square in the middle there is in fact twice as big as the square uh, as one of the four small squares that make up the, the full 
the pool figure. So if you want to make something twice as big as one, you just have to stack four of the guys uh, on top of each other like that and then cut these diagonals and boom, now you have a square twice as big as the one you started with. And in this is a very uh, kind of theoretically, in terms of the theoretical mathematics, phys pure geometry, is a very uh, uh, fundamental kind of construction to to make take an area and make it twice as big it's like a, a very a kind of building block of geometrical theory you know very f fundamental it's, it's not one of those things where oh yeah i need to make a sundial because i need to keep track of time or some practical reason or other but rather it's a very pure theoretical uh kind of question to make something twice as big and the same then for to double a cube that's the same kind of question but in three dimensions how do I make a cube twice as big? I couldn't repeat the trick, sticking four cubes next to each other, doing some kind of diagonal, you know, whatever. That's not going to work. And however, what is going to work is using parabolas and hyperbolas. So that's I have drawn here these equations. So I mean, constructing to double a cube. Obviously, what I would need to do is to have a side length, which is the cube root of two, because then the volume will be two, which is twice as big as the uh, unit whichever side I had for the, the one I started with cube my initial cube so how do I make a cube that's twice as big I have to construct a number cube root of two somehow extract it somehow from by some f however I'm gonna uh, make it that has to be the end goal of it and in order to do that I can use these two conic sections whose equations I have written over here on the right so on the bottom I had the usual uh, the parabola here famous parabola, and then um, above that a uh, certain hyperbola and you see how I can combine these if I plug the if, if I substitute from the bottom equation the expression for for y into the first one then I get x cubed equals 2 so I get x equals the cube root of 2 so in fact I this these two guys if I can assume that I know how to draw hyperbolas and parabolas then I can just find the point of intersection of those two and that will tell me the cube root of 2 and that will tell me how to double cube so Interestingly, uh, this was in fact th the main motivation of the Greeks by all indications. So all the historical record is not so complete, but nevertheless, it seems very clear that, just as I've written here, that in fact the last one is the main one for the Greek tradition. This is why the Greeks were so obsessed with studying conic sections. It was for this pure, very pure, very foundational, very theoretical purpose of doubling the cube. And although they were uh aware of some of these earlier ones the first uh, three that we discussed that they played some part it seems but really not uh so so, so you can uh, argue that the historical record indicates that in fact they were more interested in these theoretical reasons than the particular practical ones that uh, were listed above so mathematics was driven from a, a very uh, a th theoretical type of orientation rather than a practical one it's qu quite uh, interesting to know even though the practical reasons were pretty powerful and also it's of course striking to notice that the fact that conic sections uh, are described projectile motion and planetary motion completely unknown to the Greeks they had no in no uh, knowledge whatsoever of this and yet they worked out uh, the theory of conic sections in great detail so that by the time these things were discovered in the 17th century that the conic sections are perfect for describing nature it everybody already knew everything about conic sections and uh, it's a pretty remarkable kind of development really right? that that some pure or some some a theory that people developed from purely mathematical reasons turned out to be exactly suited for describing the real world in the manner of uh, the 17th century theories of projectile motion and uh, planetary motion so it's a pretty uh, striking indeed how something that was developed for completely different purposes can turn out to be perfectly suited for describing the real world it's the magic of of mathematics right there